We're now about a mile away from the shores of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, near Osborne Reef. Fifty years ago, people decided to make an artificial reef here, but little did they know it would become a problem. Why? Well, because the reef was made out of tires. The concept of making artificial reefs isn't new, and it's generally a good idea. People often build reefs to boost marine life and make the area more appealing for fishing. When it comes to using tires, the idea was to kill two birds with one stone, help marine life thrive, and clean up the excess junk. Back in the 1970s, they thought it was a good idea to toss car tires into the ocean to avoid having them clutter the landscape. Now, the very thought of it seems not just wrong, but downright environmentally crazy. Times have changed, and so is our perspective on ecology. Plus, the authorities in Broward County thought the whole tire dump thing was a good idea, and even the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers got on board. Basically, in the spring of 1974, over 100 private boats happily signed up to be a part of the project. With the USS Thrush from the U.S. Navy leading the way, they dropped thousands of tire bundles onto the reef. The big moment came when two million tires secured with steel clips were dumped across 37 acres of the ocean floor, just over a mile from the shore and 65 feet deep. Ever wondered why we ended up with a ton of useless tires? Well, it traces back to the 1960s, when worn-out tires in the U.S. started piling up in dumps, making their way into unauthorized landfills and just outright wreaking havoc. Catastrophic fires have happened at these dumps, making the air and water quality even worse. On top of that, these landfills drew in bugs and mosquitoes, putting nearby towns at risk of diseases. Back then, nobody really knew what to do with the massive pile of tires. Waiting around won't cut it when it comes to tires. Those things decompose at a snail's pace, about 50 to 80 years in a landfill. Also, tires just keep piling up over time. On top of that, about 75% of the tire space is a total waste, just begging for something else to take its spot. Nowadays, a whopping 1 billion tires reach the end of the road each year. About 4 billion of these worn-out tires just end up in landfills and storehouses worldwide. Sure, things were different half a century ago with fewer cars, but it was still easy to gather enough tires for making a reef. Plus, it was a great idea. Osborne Reef was meant to become the biggest man-made coral reef globally, and that might be why lots of folks got on board. It's awesome to be a part of something that big. Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company decided that this was just the sort of project they should be involved in and donated tires and equipment to bind the tires together, while other tires came from dumps. Goodyear liked the idea so much that they even got a blimp to drop a gold-painted tire into the ocean as a ceremonial opening to the project. A press release from the company stated that the tires would provide a haven for fish and other aquatic species and mentioned the excellent properties of scrap tires as reef material. Back in the 1970s, things were quite different. So were our thoughts about ecology. The notion of a tire reef might sound weird today, but back then it was seen as a cool idea. The plan was to make a comfy home for sea creatures with the bonus of potentially boosting marine life in the area by two or even three times. Imagine it as building a new neighborhood. As the place gets busier with residents, you get all sorts of places opening up. When there's a need, you get coffee spots, laundry places, unique shops and bars, and who knows, perhaps even a movie theater. There even was some sort of theory, just without the whole movie theater thing. It was believed that the tire reef would promote the growth of new corals, which in turn would improve local biodiversity and attract more wild fish to the waters of Florida which would have a beneficial effect on the local economy. Fishermen could reel in larger catches, pocket more cash from selling fish, and tourists would definitely be eager to explore such a unique reef. It seemed like a win-win for everyone involved, no exceptions. You've probably realized by now that the reality didn't quite match the dreams of those who made the reef. The concept of any artificial reef involves sinking a large, immovable object to the ocean floor for marine life to inhabit. The crucial part here is that it needs to stay put. The whole plan only works if the tires remain in place for decades. But that wasn't going to happen with tires. When they put the tires down, some were just scattered around. 
But you know, most of them were still tied up with nylon or steel clips to keep them together. The problem was, nobody bothered to see if those ties could handle being in the ocean. So those structures didn't really last. They fell apart. Storms and hurricanes scattered the tires all over the place. Some even ended up on the shore. In the end, only 10% of the tires turned into reef homes, and even then it was just a few sponge species making themselves comfortable there. After a while, people realized that tires didn't just provide a good enough surface for life, they were light, small, and uncomfortable. No creatures wanted to settle on them. Creating artificial reefs from concrete blocks turned out to be much more practical, even though some initially thought it was more expensive. However, the true expenses only became apparent when you consider the long-term consequences. But the problem with tires bothering marine life turned out to be just the start. If they had simply stayed put at the bottom, useless to anyone, we wouldn't even have to make this video. But guess what? Those tires were moving. Currents and storms dragged them across the closest natural coral reefs, squashing poor corals and keeping them from bouncing back. Rubber stuff turning into flying hazards is wrecking coral reefs and other underwater homes. Those reefs already have a lot on their plate. Pollution, shoreline building, too much fishing, and that whole climate change mess. You know. Coral reefs are unique environments where many marine plants and animals find food, homes, and places to breed. By the way, some of these creatures are at risk. And then a random tire enters the scene. It obliterates the entire reef as if it's a tank with giant treads. To make matters worse, it drags the wreckage onto the shore, leaving the tire among other reef-wrecking culprits. What was supposed to be a rescue operation turned into a total disaster. Remember that tires decompose at a snail's pace. Don't be fooled into thinking they're harmless to the land and water problem due to the presence of heavy metals and other pollutants. Simply burying them in damp soil could lead to these toxins getting into the groundwater. Just think about how bad it gets if the tire goes straight into the ocean. Water's all over the place, and every living thing is constantly dealing with it. And when that water gets contaminated, so do their bodies. Old and worn-out tires are known to release harmful chemicals and heavy metals into the water, posing a threat to marine life. These toxic substances can prove fatal for underwater creatures. Also, when tires break down into small fragments, they create a hazard by entangling marine animals in a web of debris, essentially killing them. What's interesting is that effective artificial reefs draw in a ton of fish. Sounds great, right? Well, here's the thing. With more fish comes more predators. And these predators don't just appear out of thin air, they ditch their usual habitats to feast on these reefs. This disrupts the natural balance because now there's a shortage of predators in their regular habitats, so you're left with an excess of prey, a disrupted ecosystem, and everything goes to hell. What seemed like a good idea ended up causing more harm than good. So people saw what they did and realized they needed to fix the mess and rescue the reef. Back in 2001, Dr. Robin Sherman at Nova Southeastern University got a $30,000 grant, which is now almost $50,000, from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to start getting rid of tires. She only managed to pull out 1,600 tires from the reef and it cost $17 to remove one. That's around $28 in today's money. In 2002, representatives of environmental authorities in Florida and Broward County joined the cleanup effort. They made an estimate and found that saving the reef would be incredibly expensive. Five years later, in 2007, Broward County reached out to the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs and asked the military for help. The military was down because it was a chance to train for rescue missions. Cleaning up the reef indeed felt a bit like a military mission. Picture this, 40 divers dove down and around 20 feet below the water's surface, the reason for the dive became apparent. Tires. All over the place. Like someone decided to turn the ocean into a junkyard. Using ropes and special floating devices, the divers managed to haul up around a thousand tires daily. Getting rid of old tires is a two-step process. First, divers team up to fasten and secure the tires underwater, and then they gradually hoist them onto a barge. This task is heavily influenced by ever-changing sea conditions, including currents and weather. Well, this task isn't a walk in the park. At first, when the military took on the challenge, you could pretty much dive anywhere and easily collect the tires in bundles. But now a bunch of those loose tires rolled away to who knows where. Some even made it all the way to North Carolina. And that's just the ones they've managed to track down. Overall, pulling tires from the seabed is usually a long, challenging, and expensive process. And it doesn't stop there. 
You can't just haul the tires onto the shore and call it a day. Back in 2007, the idea was to chip the tires collected off Fort Lauderdale's coast for road projects and burn them as fuel. Every year, more and more old tires end up getting transformed into fuel. A bunch of the messed up reef pieces are in really bad shape and can't be recycled, so they take these tires to the Solid Waste Authority in West Palm Beach, Florida, where they turn them into power. Maybe that's the best thing to do with the tires. Plus, taking out a single tire from the sea is getting more and more expensive. Just think, it started at $17, that's like $28 today. Even if the cost doesn't change, there are a whopping 2 million tires down there. Problem is, there's not enough budget to pull them all up. Fixing errors from the 1970s gets more expensive every year. For the past five years, taking off tires has been running us $18.75 a tire. Starting February 2024, the new rate is $29.50 per tire. The reason for the cost increase is that removing the remaining tires has become more labor-intensive. Since the tires are no longer bundled together, we need to find them, gather them up, and securely fasten them. Turns out there's a whole bunch of work to do and the damage is pretty massive. The state's struggling to handle everything by itself. Bringing in private contractors seems like a reasonable move, but they already gave it a go once, and it ended up being a whopping $30 million. The plan was to dip into everyone's wallet with taxes, but let's face it, taxpayers wouldn't be cool with that. So what if we just gather everyone to clean up those tires? Nah, even if you're really concerned about the planet, the reefs, and the environment in general, you can't just show up at Osborne Reef and start cleaning. First, you gotta deal with permits, licenses, and talk to the authorities. It could take months. But if things work out, they'll give you a spot to handle, clear out tires, and keep track of where they're going. There's potential to cash in on this, but most likely you'll need to set up some kind of business. Take the Osborne Reef, for instance. It rakes in $5,000 a day. But that money ends up in the company's pockets. The real question is, what's the take-home for the divers and the rest of the crew? And is the whole venture actually profitable when you factor in all the expenses? Wait, what about the military? They've been involved in the cleanup effort. Did they help? After all, it was an army ship that once participated in throwing tires into the water. You know, the military actually pitched in a lot. When the local authorities asked for help, the army agreed to clear out the tires for just $2 million since they were doing their training at the same time. It's still a lot, but when you think about it compared to $30 million, it's like a bargain. It's also an opportunity to train. Military divers and crew members on army ships got hands-on training for rescue missions in wartime scenarios. What's even more important is that they learned how to collaborate with different government agencies at the federal, state, and local levels. It's a valuable skill, especially during natural disasters when everyone needs to coordinate efforts. Unfortunately, the attempts didn't pan out because army divers grappling with tires were being called back for more pressing duties. While environmental issues spanning decades are important, human lives take precedence. During this period, the United States was caught up in two wars, and natural disasters also made things worse. For instance, when Haiti was struck by an earthquake, the same divers pitched in to clear the port. Did the military accomplish a lot? And how many tires did they end up getting? Nobody really knows for sure. The positive estimate puts the figure at over 677,000 tires, but some other sources suggest it might be around 439,000 tires. First, Dr. Sherman removed 1,600 tires as part of her grant. Then the military collected 10,000 tires in 2007, 43,900 in 2008, and 73,000 in 2009. However, it's worth noting that tire numbers vary widely, making it difficult to determine what's true and what's exaggerated. You can actually buy bracelets made out of old tires, and the money goes towards cleaning up the reefs. So if you're keen on pitching in to rescue the reefs, that's one way to do it. By November 2019, IDC was hauling between 2,000 and 5,000 tires each week, amassing a grand total of 250,000 tires. Another 500,000 tires are believed to still lie down there, however the actual figures are still unknown. The big issue is nobody really knows how many tires got dropped or where to even begin counting them. They're saying that we'll find out the exact dates for finishing the cleanup in 2024, which is pretty soon, but there's some doubt about whether it'll wrap up anytime soon considering the tire removal contract runs out as early as 2028. That means there's still a whole lot of work left to do, a whole lot. Check out this chart. Let's say there are around 500,000 tires left. Every year they remove, well, about 50,000 of them. 
At this rate, it's going to take another 10 years to get the job done, just like in 2023. On one hand, the figures looked much better in 2020, but remember, each year it takes more and more time to track down and gather those tires. Fixing things is getting more expensive and harder, and we don't even know how many tires we've managed to pull out or how many are still there. Ever feel like you're dealing with a never-ending task where nothing you try seems to make a difference? That's pretty much what it's like dealing with tires off the Florida coast. It's enough to dampen the spirits of even the most enthusiastic advocates for a cleaner planet. But there's more bad news. Even if people somehow miraculously gather up all the tires thrown into the water for that project, it won't automatically bring back the natural reef. Just removing human interference won't make it go back to how it was in a snap. Magic doesn't cut it here. Global warming isn't doing any favors for the reefs, especially when you think about how slow they're bouncing back. Scientists are noticing that damaged reefs, like the ones messed up by tires, are taking forever to recover. I mean, we're talking about a seriously long time, even after the last tire is finally removed. Still a way to go on that front. Coral reefs can shrug off minor damage and recover in a decade, but that's minor damage. When tires roll over them like a hurricane, it's a whole other matter. So restoring a coral reef takes a long time. Think at least two decades, and that's if everything goes smoothly. Massive corals grow at a rate of 0.1 to 0.8 inches every year, while branching corals can manage up to 4 inches annually. It could take a whopping 10,000 years to form a coral reef from the ground up. The upside is we don't have to start from scratch. But here's the catch. Even if we're trying to regenerate it, the reef won't be an exact replica of its original self. They're planning to drop a new artificial reef at Osborne Reef, but this time it's supposed to be more eco-friendly. Or at least that's the idea from the scientists. We'll find out in 30 years what the environmentalists have to say about it. Other people have experimented with using tires to form artificial reefs elsewhere. However, they secured the tires to concrete so they wouldn't sway around and harm marine life. People have set up similar reefs in the Northeast US, the Gulf of Mexico, Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia, and Africa. So basically, things could work in Florida if people would take a moment to crunch the numbers instead of just tossing a bunch of tires into the water. Lots of countries like the USA, Japan, Malaysia, Israel, France, Portugal, Spain, and Italy are tossing tires into the ocean. France has around 3,200,000 cubic feet of fake reefs, but they're not as big as Japan's. Japan is the world's leader, with over 706 million cubic feet of sunken tires mainly put there to boost the fish population. People have different views on tire reefs. Some countries use this trick to give marine life new homes. When things are done right and the tires don't go rolling around, smashing corals, it looks like a pretty good solution. But, but there's always a catch. The stuff in the tires is still bad, slowly breaking down and poisoning the water and everyone in it. Fish definitely don't want to be surrounded by chemicals, so they won't stick around on tires. Creating artificial reefs is nothing new, and most of the time they're made from sunken ships. Similarly, offshore structures like oil and gas platforms, bridges, and lighthouses are frequently repurposed to serve as homes for underwater ecosystems. When it comes to making artificial reefs, you've got options like rocks, cinder blocks, and wood. These days, companies out there focus on crafting strong reefs using materials like limestone, steel, or concrete. A good example is the Gibraltar artificial reef. It's created in the Mediterranean waters surrounding the British Overseas Territory of Gibraltar. The initiative was launched in 1973, so it's not surprising they had plans to use tires for the construction. Luckily, people soon figured out that the waves were tossing the tires around and burying them in the sand. They had to come up with a different plan. Eventually, the car got submerged, followed by boats and barges, all scrubbed clean of any junk. Later on, they brought in a massive 65-ton wooden boat, True Joy, also known as Noah's Ark, to add to the growing underwater world. The final touch was tossing in the leftovers of a decent-sized cargo ship called MV New Flame. With concrete blocks reinforced with metal spikes, the reef gradually took on its true form. Today, it's a thriving habitat for marine life and a hot spot for divers eager to observe them in their natural environment. Temple Reef is a different kind of success story. Nestled off the coast of India and created in 2013, this reef is like a recycled haven. Made from things like concrete blocks, stones, trees, palm leaves, and iron rods, 
Since its birth, it's turned into a lively habitat for marine creatures, boasting over 75 different species, from corals and fish to sea snakes, stingrays, and crustaceans. The American Redbird Reef was put together using 714 old New York subway cars, 86 retired tanks and armored vehicles, 8 tugboats and barges, as well as 3,000 tons of ballasted truck tires. Ballasted is the key word here. The tires alone wouldn't cut it, so between 2001 and 2008, marine life around the reef shot up by a whopping 400 times. Basically, as you realize, they use anything stable and not too harmful to nature to make artificial reefs. Things like planes, big battleships, concrete statues filled with ashes, porcelain insulators, and even broken corals. By the way, the largest man-made reef came to life when they sank the USS Oriskany, a 44,000-ton aircraft carrier off Pensacola, Florida. They sank it in 2006, while on the other side of the coast, people were just starting to deal with the tire problem. But if people are successfully making these artificial reefs everywhere, like the one in Florida, why did Osborne Reef not work out? Maybe they should have done more research, like figure out if tires are actually safe for marine life. Plus, it wouldn't hurt to keep tabs on the reef after dumping the tires to prevent messing up the natural one. Experts say the right thing before making a reef, make sure that it'll work. Perhaps there's no need to add anything here. Pretty much sums it up. See you later.